let it, let it take up just a few more, but we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, last week we covered, for those of you that were here last week, um, we covered uh, basically full face masks. I, I went through the differences between the Guardian and the, uh, and the Spectrum full face masks. You know, we're not limited to these masks uh, at Ocean Technology says, but I think that one of the secrets to our success is that we, if, if a mask has a COM port, we build comms for it. Um, there are some older masks that we just don't service anymore. Um, you know, the old U.S. divers mask, we, you know, that they haven't been made for 30 years. We don't, we don't make comms for that. Um, but all the current masks that are out there, we do make, uh, make them for. And one mask in particular, we, we kind of stopped supporting simply because we had, uh, had a lot of issues with the company and I won't get into any names or anything. Our, the primary masks we work with are Kirby Morgan M48s. Um, the Exo 26, we, I think we're still making comms for it. It's been discontinued now for a couple of years. The, uh, the Guardian, the Inner Spiro, you know, we're, we're huge supporters of the Inner Spiro mask. Uh, our history really is based on the Inner Spiro and the success of the company was based on our partnership with Inner Spiro. And it's a great mask. So don't get me wrong. I, I'll never have anything bad to say about the Inner Spiro mask. You can consider it sort of competitive, but I don't, um, because I still teach more technician courses, uh, for Inner Spiro really than Inner Spiro does. Um, Inner Spiro Aaron at Interspiro. I don't know if Aaron's in here. Uh, chime up if you're here, Aaron. Um, Aaron with Interspiro does basically what I do for OTS. He does for Interspiro. But Interspiro is a broad company. They uh, they do um, uh, the the biggest part of their con their their business is SCBAs. Uh, the dive industry is a small small portion of that. So Aaron covers all of that. So he's a pretty busy busy guy. Um, let me see. Oh, there we go. It should be scrolling now. So, uh, yeah, the band mask, we do make, uh, Dave Hill asks, we do make comms for the band masks uh, and the hats. Uh, depends on how old. I don't know. I don't know. Some of the older, you know, like the the M48s, or not the M48s, the KMB9s, uh, KMB10s, the 18, I think our comms will fit an 18. I haven't really played with those. A 28, it will. Hats, uh, the everything from the the 17 on up, the 17K on up um, to, well, they're running out of sevens at some point. If there's anybody here from Kirby Morgan, hey, John O'Neill. Um, but we do make, uh, we do make, um, uh, uh, comms, like I say, for everything. Dan, the, the CO2 in the, in the spectrum has been tested. I don't have the results right here in front of me. Uh, you, if you want, we can share that with you or give us a call. Um, the, uh, uh, the Europeans, we do some special stuff for the Europeans as far as the spectrum goes. And, um, uh, uh, but it, uh, it, it, it does, we have done a good bit of CO2 work up on it. Uh, the mouth pocket area spectrum uses a normal second stage. It, it, uh, it, well, you do have a little bit of a dead space in there. Um, who, who asked that? I it just scrolled right, right past. Um, you do have a little bit of a dead space in there. So you do, um, <laughs> I wanted to get into this, but I'll go ahead and I'll answer some of these questions as we go. Question regarding, uh, Harry, uh, from up in Canada asks, uh, the difference between the ME16R and the ME 500 besides the way it's mounted. Uh, the ME500 was just a, a design, uh, it's a different microphone. I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't played with it a whole lot. It, it mounts different. We, the, it uses a wire that inserts into the microphone and then a screw tightens, you tighten the screw down on the wire. Whereas with the ME16R hot mic, um, it has, you have to have the gold feet, uh, they're brass with gold plated brass that now screw into the microphone itself. So it's mounted a little bit different. Um, you could go from the ME 16 R to the ME 500 by trimming off those, um, those gold feet a little harder to go the other direction because you have to take the wires and solder the gold feet to go from the ME 150 to the, I don't have an example. I do have an example of the, of the ME or the, uh, the, the hot mic. And I, on the inside, that's the hot mic on the inside, the ME 150, that's the ME 16 R the ME 150 looks very similar to that. Uh, but it's a little bit, um, it's, it's a little thicker and uh, a little bit different. Um, 
that one, we, we designed that for different applications, primarily to go to the buddy phone, trying to bring costs down a little bit of the buddy phone. Um, actually trying to, today's day and age, it's not a matter of bringing costs down, it's a matter of trying to prevent costs from going up too much. So, well, let's go ahead and we'll get into this. Um, again, if you have questions, go ahead and we'll, uh, um, we'll, we'll answer some of the questions, but I wanna go through the basics of it. Uh, Dave asks about narrating to the camera or to the back of a Hero 8. There is a way with the 2010. And Josh and, uh, and uh, Ryan at our office, we, we've done that quite a bit. We have a video on our website. If you go to videos, and I tried to go to share, share screens, but it wasn't letting me share a screen a minute ago. Um, if you go to our website and you go over to videos and there's a pop down there, you can just click on videos and it'll open all the videos. If you pop down, it'll go to selected videos. And if you go to that, you'll see one called body shadowing. Uh, or body shadow, body shadowing. And it's Ryan and myself are diving off of uh, West Palm Beach a few years ago. And what we've got there, all that audio is recorded directly to a GoPro from using SSB 2010s and our microphone assembly. So literally what we do, and I don't have my black mask, which is set up with my rail system. I didn't bring it down here. Um, we, we have the rail system that mounts on the side of the mask. The GoPro mounts out here. We literally pop the earphone out, and I'll see if this one is set up. We pop the, no, this one's not set up, but we take the earphone out, we put a piece of dual lock. If you're familiar with dual lock, it's like Velcro, but it, it's not the same as Velcro, it's not hook and loop. It's the little balls that snap together, and it's the same material on both sides, as opposed to Velcro being two different materials. And you take it, you put the dual lock on the back of this, and you snap it on the back of your GoPro, and it's pretty crazy how good the audio is. And, and you can narrate to that. So watch that video. Again, go to videos on our website, oceantechnologysystems.com. Uh, scroll down, and you'll see uh, body shadow or body shadowing and all that, again, that video is, uh, is um, uh, all recorded directly to the GoPro, nothing complicated. It's really a pretty simple way to do it and it works well. Josh uh, Roten was one of the pioneers of that. He used the video with an RX100 on the back of his GoPro on a tray. So it was kind of cool. Okay, so let's get into the program a little bit. What I want to talk about first off, and let's, I'm going to go, uh, this is, anybody that sat in on my lectures, you're going to hear some of this is going to sound a little familiar. Um, the wireless communications, uh, let's talk, first of all, I want to talk about full face masks. Something I didn't cover because it's integral to the, any communication system is, the, uh, uh, is, a, is a full face mask. Now, we have half masks, which you wear your regular mask and you wear a half mask and it's, you have two straps on your head. Regulator sets way out in front here. I used it like once and that was enough for me. It's a solution to a problem, but uh, full face masks are really the best platform that we can put our communications in because that full face mask gives us an oral nasal pocket to be able to articulate into a microphone mounted in said mask. Um, there are basically, and I'm going to talk real quick about this, there's four reasons why we dye full face masks. And uh, it, very, it, it depends on your need. So not necessarily in any particular order here uh, of importance. Uh, one of the first reasons we dive it is for environmental protection. For those of us that were in public safety, and I was a deputy sheriff for a long time, 14 years in the military before that, but I didn't do a lot of public safety diving. I certainly wasn't well educated in it at the time that I was doing it. We did a couple of body searches and stuff like that. My very first body search was in 1979, a long time ago, and we had no clue as to what we were doing. So things have certainly changed now. Um, but so for environmental protection, so commercial divers, people don't like commercial work and public safety, you should always consider your water as, as uh, potentially hazardous to your health. Uh, you know, you're diving in water that's not uh, not what most sport divers would want to go into. If you're diving on vehicles, you're dealing with petrochemicals and hydrocarbons. Um, if you're dealing on bodies or in, uh, in you know, some of the worst environments that we dive in uh, as public safety divers is uh, uh, golf course ponds, municipal park ponds. Uh, fecal coliform is very high. And in golf course ponds, you know, that that keeps the grass green and the bugs dead it go, it's going into that pond. And so that's, uh, that's certainly not, you can't imagine that that's very good for your health. So w with a dry suit and an attached latex hood and sealed over top of that latex hood and an attached dry gloves, you're afforded a, some prophylactic protection against the water that you're diving in. So it's, in now there's something else. I want to say this, and I'm going to try to say this as quickly as I can. 
I go out on a lot of operations and training, all, mostly all training, uh, training and demonstration operations. And from a public safety diving standpoint, and uh, as a dive, if I were to the dive supervisor, I can tell you I'd probably kick most of the guys out of the water because I see guys take their water, their masks off and they let their mask drop in the water. Now, for all practical purposes, you've weaponized that water. So now they're gonna take that mask, which they're wearing a dry suit and a full face mask to protect themselves against. They're gonna take that wet full face mask and they're gonna put it on their face and they're gonna inhale. Now, what happens when you do that? Well, you aerosol that water and all the contaminants that are in it. And again, for people that have listened to my lectures before you hear this ad nauseum, but um, so that weapon, uh, that, that aerosol water is now the most dangerous you can possibly make it. And the most effective way to introduce it into every mucous membrane between your chin and your eyebrows, the deepest recesses of your lungs, your gastrointestinal systems, your eyes, your sinuses, your mouth, you know, is just, is now exposed to all that stuff that you're trying to protect yourself from. So if from an environmental protection standpoint, you need to maintain the integrity of your full face mask, keep it dry to keep that stuff out of your face and out of your body. So you're wearing that stuff for for a reason for environmental protection as PPE, as we all, you know, we're, we're hearing that everywhere now. It used to be, uh, you know, fairly specific to, to our disciplines, but now it's everywhere. It's talk, everybody's talking about personal protective equipment. Okay, so enough of that. Now, so environmental protection, number one. Uh, number two, physiological protection. If for any reason a diver goes unconscious underwater with a five point strapping system that these masks have on it and sealed to your face, you're afforded, or you have a breathable environment. Uh, strapped to your face. So if you go unconscious, you're not going to drop a mouthpiece. So you have that breathable environment uh, strapped to your face. So you're afforded an opportunity of survival. And when I say afforded an opportunity of survival, there are no guarantees. Uh, but you're certainly going to be better off than you would be with a bite mouthpiece. And, you know, you think about the newspaper reports, a diver found on the bottom without his oxygen mouthpiece in his mouth because they don't know we breathe air instead of oxygen. And, um, you know, usually it comes, you know, that, you know, failed to revive and pronounce dead wherever on the scene or at the hospital or whatever the case may be. With a full face mask, again, at least you're afforded an opportunity of survival. Um, again, no guarantees. Uh, but what, you know, what could happen? Any reason a diver goes unconscious, convulsive disorders. And I'm going to extend this into even more. Um, we had a young man a while back that called me up that had, um, he was born with a cleft palate. And he'd had no, multiple surgeries to fix that. And in addition, he had no uh, uh, cartilage in his nose. And he couldn't hold a bite mouthpiece because of the reconstruction of the jaw, the features of his jaw. And a full face mask allowed him to get into diving. And he was just super excited when he got it to work out for him. So again, you know, that's, that's just one of many instances. Um, uh, people with TMJ or other dental issues that uh, might not be able to hold a bite mouthpiece. Um, and again, convulsive, if, if for any reason you go into convulsions underwater, obviously. Um, the, uh, so, you know, again, physiological. The third reason for communications, I touched on that already. Again, the oral nasal pocket with a microphone embedded in it uh, gives you a, 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 an airspace in which you can articulate into the electronics. That's what we're going to talk about next. The fourth reason uh, is really for the diving experience. I mean, a lot of people just enjoy diving with a full face mask and communications. Also, to add on to that, the experience is a safety factor that's added for communications. Um, if uh, uh, when you think about it, that the ability uh, to say, hold up, I have a problem over here um, or I'm freezing, I'm cold, you know, so somebody's going to hypothermic. But just the ability to say, I need help where without it, you don't. And you think of all the dive, not all, but a lot of the diving accidents out there that if somebody, if that diver had the capability of saying, I have a problem, I need help, how, you know, and to, to be able to zero in on it. You know, I read a lot of accident reports where uh, last I saw them, they were right behind me. I don't know what happened. And then, and then they're missing and gone. Um, happens a lot of different places. Um, I think a monastery beach up in California that, that happens up there, uh, a, a, a dive in particular, with that's uh, where that scenario came from. So just and the safety factor that it adds as well. So, OK, now into it. Let's talk about the full face mask and how it pertains to the communications. One of the big deals and the full face mask, when you think of the full face mask, um, and the ear microphone assembly that what we do and a lot of people look at this as some kind of magic that we do we don't basically we have a headset with a boom microphone so you have the headset with the boom microphone so you have your earphones you have the microphone and you have a push to talk button right here 
Okay, so what do we do? We, with a full face mask, we do the exact same thing, except we make it waterproof. And, uh, and in making it waterproof, and I'm not gonna be able to answer a lot of questions, I'm gonna scroll through and, and, and go, uh, go through your questions. I'll answer them. So go, go back on the, to the, the Facebook page, and if, you, you should get an alert that I commented to your question a little later on. But so again, back to what we're doing. Um, we take a, a headset with a boom microphone, we make it waterproof. So the microphone being on the inside here, and you can see the microphone, uh, eh, there you go, the little red microphone, <laughs> this is weird. Oh, there you go, microphone down here. Okay, so the microphone, boom microphone, okay. Push the talk button, push the talk button. Earphones, earphones, one on each side. So now this is the ear microphone assembly, then it plugs into your radio. Now, whoops, I just unplugged my radio, unplugged my thing here, sorry. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. So what we do is we take that, that whip and we plug it in to the radio. Now we call this a radio, it's not really a radio. It is, as we list, it, list here, it's an acoustic telephone, okay? So it's an ultrasonic uh, device and I'll talk more about that here in just a couple of minutes. Um, but, you know, so, so this plugs into that. Now that's the, your microphone assembly with the SSB 2010s or the single sideband units. As you can tell, I'm starting to depopulate the couch over here. So, uh, Mai, it's good to see you there and you're sitting in the, on the floor as well. Um, the, this is a buddy phone and this is a transceiver. The, the uh, 2010 is also a transceiver. Now, what do I mean by transceiver? And I keep doing that, keep hitting my earphone here. Um, it's a, it transmits and it receives, transceiver, okay? So the buddy phone uh, is, is a standalone unit and it does exactly the same thing as the other unit, it's just lower power and a little more convenient in a one easy, easy package here. So with the buddy phone, you have your antenna here, which is not really an antenna, but it's a transducer if you think of it as an antenna. You also have the, the two screws on the front here are the water switches. On the back here, you've got the battery cap, a 9 volt battery goes in there. And then on the inside, you have the earphone that goes up against your ear. And then the cable goes down to the same microphone on the inside as the, as the ear microphone assembly. So everything wrapped up on one neat little package attached to your mask. This puts out about a quarter of a watt of energy, and I'll talk about energy here in a little bit. Hopefully I'll remember to, to cover all these topics. Uh, but it does exactly the same thing as the 2010 does. Has two channels, four channels. Um, we have as many as eight channels, depending on the unit that you're using. So those are the two wireless systems we have. The SSB units, or we also have magnet comms, which still sort of fall under that band, that uh, category of, of single sideband radios, um, of the uh, the external or the, uh, the the body attached radios, if you will. The um, uh, so let's talk a little bit about ultrasonic communications. Now that you've seen what the equipment is, I want to talk about um, signal propagation and how this stuff actually works. Now I don't have a whiteboard here and I wouldn't bore you with that anyway because uh, I'm not artistic at all. And um, so, but, but how, we use, or how we communicate through water, underwater, is that the electronics take your voice into the microphone, into the electronics package, and it converts the, your, the human voice into an analog. Now, a lot of people claim they have a digital si system. They don't. They ha There's not a lot of people out there who do this, but when somebody says it's digital, it's digitally processed. But the signal actually going from transducer to transducer is a, an analog signal. So it's basically the human voice, your voice, that's translated now from what is now audible to us to, into ultrasound. And the frequencies, and I don't want to get too complicated, I have a tendency to over explain stuff. Um, the frequencies that we use in specialized equipment, we're in 8 and 11 kilohertz. That's mostly, not very many people deal with that. That's mostly submarines and stuff. Long range, low, low frequency, long range. And then, uh, but for the most part, we use 25 kilohertz to uh, 33 kilohertz and, um, or, you know, 33,000 hertz. Um, and that transmits very well. There's higher frequencies. We could go higher, but we don't want to because it shadows more. It's cleaner the higher you go, but it's also less power. So the lower the frequency, the higher the power. I want you to think about something. When you hear that car, and we all know which car we're talking about, we hear that car go, rolling down the road, boom, 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 boom. Some guy's blaring his, uh, or girl, blaring their music. What do you hear? 
you hear those bass tones and that's the low frequency. So you don't hear the tweet, the, the, the tweeter or the high frequency. So let's think about that a little bit. As we're sending signals through the water, the lower the frequency, the longer the range and the more power you can put out. Reason why. Think of it as a speaker, and uh, the big bass speaker is a big speaker, so it's moving a lot of air. Well, a, a lower frequency is a larger transducer, so it has a larger surface area and can move a lot more water. The the higher the frequency, think of a Twitter, you know, or a tweeter, a tweeter, not Twitter, sorry, the tweeter on your stereo speakers, and that's the little speaker that gives your high frequency. And, uh, it, um, and so the higher the frequency, it, the smaller the, the transducer, so the less water it moves. So we, we make a compromise there. And what we found was 33 kilohertz to 25 kilohertz are the best bands for, uh, for what we want to do in the ranges and the power output that we use. Um, the Buddy Phone and the Dale, the, the uh, Buddy Phone and the SSB 2010s use common frequencies. Uh, channel one through eight, channel one through four, channel one and or frequency A and B, one and two. I don't want to get too complicated. You can see that on our website. We should have an explanation of that. I could write an article on that. Um, maybe I'll do that. So I have to make a note here. Uh, so, but yes, they, they do match up. So back to frequencies, the low frequencies, high frequencies. Hopefully that makes sense. The higher the frequency, the smaller the transducer, because again, it's, you know, compared to, and again, it's a uh, low frequency has a larger, larger, so it can move more water, so longer range. Um, so again, it's an ultrasound. Now, ultrasound, when you think about ultrasound in water, you're thinking, you're thinking uh, sonar, and that's basically it. Uh, the frequency we use are lo usually lower than uh, the, what your depth sounders or your fish finders use. However, when you go under the boat, you can hear it tick, 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 tick through your system sometimes. And uh, so it, it is something that, that you, can, you can hear it, but generally they don't interfere with each other. So we talked a, a little bit, I don't know if I touched, I did touch a little bit about thermoclines. And uh, so let's talk about as far as signal propagation. So we send that wave out. Um, and, and again, well, I don't want to bounce around too much here. Let's talk about getting that signal from one transducer to the other. So you have uh, the SSB 2010's transducer here. It's a cylinder looking thing. And then say I've got a boat transducer that looks like this. So we've dropped this in from the boat, trans, the boat transducer in the water. Now these transducers, this transducer is going to be excited electrically to the frequency that we're running it at, and, uh, and it's going to vibrate. Now uh, we depend on the incompressibility of water. So when you move water over here, it's going to be able to be picked up that movement and by the other transducer over here. So, um, and, and it's a ceramic ring on the inside there that uh, there are little micro compressions that picks it up and that generates a little electrical signal, goes into the thing and it translates it back down into an audible signal. So the way we have it, translated into high frequency, transmitted through this transducer, moves the water to the other transducer on the other side. And then this picks it up because this can listen. Um, if you take your transducer and you rub them or shake keys, uh, that's a good demonstration as to what you hear in that frequency frequency and then the receiver at the other side which just happens to be another 2010 that's set up with an extension cord on the transducer that's a surface station um, it translates that signal down to the audible signal so that's the way that works you need to make sure you're on the same channels and so forth so let's talk about what what can interfere with the um uh communications uh Biological noise, noise and mechanical noises. When you're underwater and you have your gear uh, set up, and the squ let's say the squelch is open, somebody shoot me a note and remind me later on because a lot of times I have a tendency to forget about talking about squelch. But when you have your squelch open, meaning you're picking up all the audio in the water, you're not filtering any of that out. Or squelch, think of a squelch like a gate. It opens up when you're talking and when somebody's signal is coming through and then you're hearing all that other static and then the squelch closes down and, and shuts that noise out. Um, but then when somebody talks, boom, it opens up. When you're talking, it's open. Good, you know, it's transmitting different, different process. But anyway, um, so the, the, with the squelch open, you're listening to all that noise out there. Shrimp make a lot of noise. Uh, and any body of water at, uh, that has shrimp in it at any given time, it'll vary. 
in the morning, they may be quiet. In the afternoon, evening, they could be screaming loud, vice versa. You just never know. I, I don't know the biology and the, the rhythms of shrimp out there, but, but you can tell the difference in the same body of water at different times of day. The shrimp can make a lot of noise. And shrimp make a snapping noise, and it can be crazy loud sometimes. Um, I had one shrimp under me when I was working a, a one demo, and I swear he was down there with a pie pan and a wooden spoon just banging away. Now you add that amongst thousands and thousands of shrimp in a specific area that would be within your your bubble of acu your acoustic bubble where you're hit where you'll hear them, and uh, that all adds up to a, a sort of a roaring, hissing, static noise. Um, so that that can interfere with your communications in that it's uh, it, it, it's noisy. Um, the other thing is mechanical noises. Uh, if a jet ski or an, or an outboard or a, a boat goes by, you can hear that Doppler shift often where you hear the as the, go, as the boat goes by. Well, that's an acoustic sound that's put in here. One of the common questions that we get are what's the range um, that you can get out of the, out of the, and this gets into the power that I wanted to talk about earlier. The, uh, the range of, of, our, of our comm gear is gonna depend on the power, but it's also going to be very dependent on the, <laughs> my leg's going to sleep. Um, it's going to be very dependent, oh, sorry, um, on the, uh, uh, the, the acoustics in the area. There's a lot of other things, so I'm going to get into that because I touched on it already with the noise. Uh, the buddy phone, as I, as I mentioned, it puts out about a quarter to a half a watt of energy. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot. When you think about it, it's powered by a little 9-volt battery. Um, and that, but the buddy phone is designed what the buddy phone na is named. It's designed to talk to your buddy. So you're not going to get really long range out of it. No, it's kind of crazy. I've had as much as 1,039 yards. And I'm very specific because that's happened to be what it said on the GPS when we tested it. But it, we got uh, 1,039 yards out of it. That was us tweaking it in. We like to think we know what we're doing. Sometimes you know, the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, but that was, uh, that was in the Long Beach Harbor, and we had good solid bottom good uh, surface on it, and it was sort of like yelling down a pipe. Now, the one analogy I use for range is uh, a conference hall, and the ambient noise that's in an area at any given time. When, because we're using, um, again, acoustics here, it's not much different than the human voice that's produced right here. Um, think about that conference hall. Uh, you know, for us in the dive industry, we go to, um, uh, we, we go to DEMA every year, and at the end of DEMA, everybody's gone. You're the last ones out for some unknown reason, but the place is empty. And there's concrete floors. There's no booths, no people. Uh, you can hear somebody talking from 200 meters away in a normal voice. You'll hear them talking, and you might even be able to make out what they're saying. Now, you take that same conference hall, and again, no noise. So you have no ambient noise, no interference. Now, you take that same conference hall uh, during DEMA. And while you're sitting at our booth, when you come by to visit us at our at our booth, wherever the next DEMA is, Orlando, I guess, um, you, uh, uh, was it Orlando? I don't even remember. But it, w w you, you'd be hard pressed to hear somebody talking just just 15 feet from you. And, uh, you know, and I do that all the time when I'm sitting there. Some people ask me range. It's like, well, hey, hey, hang on a second. Listen to that guy right over there. And there's somebody with, you could, you could easily, you know, just almost not reach out and touch them, but get their attention if you yelled at them. But you can't hear what they're saying. You can't understand what they're saying. So hopefully that makes sense as to what, you know, again, the, the ambient noise in the area is all going to make that difference. Now, New Orleans next year? No. I thought it was the year after. Well, regardless. Um, I'm losing track. Uh, so think about that. Now, again, the same principle applies. You know, sometimes if you're working in an office and you're in a cubicle, you have to stick your head up over to talk to somebody. The same principle applies with uh, with through water communications. You can't pick it up just like talking on, on your cell phone and talk to somebody in Australia if you wanted to. It doesn't work that way. Uh, again, it's we're just taking sound, putting it in the water, and it's transmitting to another, another unit. Line of sight is always best. Um, it doesn't have to be line of sight, but if you figure, think of it as line of sight, you'll get the best communications. So we talked about ambient noise and uh, mechanicals and biologicals and stuff like that. Um, the body shadowing and shadowing uh, is another major factor. And I talked about that earlier, about that video, body shadowing. If you watch that video, again, go to our website, go to videos and look at body shadowing. You'll see Ryan kind of floating in the, in the middle of the water column there. And, uh, 
And it's a good demonstration. It's just an accident how it happened, but I got it on video and I said, hey, this is a good example. I want a, I want a video clip of this, of body shadowing. And uh, so what, when Ron and I were talking, my radio was behind my shoulder on my cylinder, on my tank strap. And if you're using a double tank strap, if, if you're using a single tank strap, you want to be careful because as you see here with my radio, uh, I've broken those out. Um, and what it's supposed to look like this, but I've broken those out. And that comes from cranking down on a cam band uh, way too often because I've been using this radio for 18 years now, uh, 18 or 19 years. And um, but it's but my radio is behind my back. Ryan's is in the same position on his, I think it was on his old other shoulder, behind his other shoulder, but regardless. What we had is our bodies between our, our radios. So our lungs, our, uh, our nitrogen blown wetsuits, the, the bubbles in our wetsuits are all an opaque object to the through water communications. And um, so you, you, need to, uh, you need to eliminate that. So when Ryan heard me say, body shouting classic example of body shouting i had to repeat myself because he couldn't hear me and then he understood what i said and then he rotates as soon as he heard me say body shadowing he just naturally rotated around to where you can see his radio i spun around i've got a rear view mirror which is really pretty cool for diving underwater a rear view mirror is uh, is handy for being able to see you're not spinning anyway so you see him in the rear view mirror and our radios are now uh, pointing to each other line of sight and you can hear the difference between those two uh communications uh, you know between the the you know body shadow not body shadow um so keep that in mind uh you know we get a lot of um a lot of dive teams call up and say, well, we're diving in lakes and we don't have uh, shore support. Well, our, shore, our support's on shore. We don't have boats because of the particular area, you know, be it a pond or whatever, or a small lake that they're responding to. And a lot of times you're walking for a distance before you have that drop off. And then the divers go out, they walk in, and then they get into the drop off of the lake itself. And then they're actually shadowed. So you've got this berm. The, you know, let me see where I can go here, where the surface station can't talk down around to the divers on the other side. I, I can't even see here. It makes sense of my, it's backwards to me. Um, so if you're, if you're behind or below the curve of the, of the uh, shore of the shoreline or the contour of the bottom, then that signal is going to go out, but it's not going to wrap around and get down to the diver below that line of sight. If that doesn't, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So the trick is, is getting it out there. So I, I will recommend to a lot of dive teams, if you're diving and everybody's environment is different, I can't tell you that, you know, this works here and works there too with every you know you have to kind of look at it and noodle out the the uh, the uh, issues in the body of water because every body of water is going to be particular as to how you get that signal from one transducer to the other um, so keep that in mind and what I do I sort of say this when you with a lot of dive teams even if it's just a milk jug and a one one pound dive weight and a piece of 550 cord suspend that transducer in the middle of that and try to get it out as far as you can to the uh, near where the dive divers are, at least where it's got a, a view of the divers. Um, so think of it that way. One of the biggest problems, and you know, people just don't know this, but you can't take the transducer and just whip it out there and let it set on the bottom. And because if this is setting on the bottom like this and it's a mud bottom, it's just going to soak up the signal and you don't get any signal. So you need to suspend this off the bottom, get it up off the bottom. Even if it's just mid water column in three feet, if that signal, look at it and think about where's that signal going, where are my divers? If they're down below something and behind it, hide from the, the signal of the transducer, then you're gonna have limited communications. It's just the way it goes and you need to get that transducer out. Um, so we've talked about the uh, uh, mechanical and biological noise. Uh, acoustic interference and how what that affects how that affects your underwater communications. Uh, I do need to back up at a certain point here and talk about microphone position. Don't let me forget that. Somebody shoot me a note and remind me to talk about microphone position. Um, and other things are thermoclines, and, and we touched on this the other day because somebody asked me about halocline. Uh, hal halocline is uh, halocline, halocline. Halocline is a uh, uh, is a uh, salt layer where you have freshwater, salt water, or varying levels of salinity. And uh, the water will separate. And we saw that a lot up in, uh, well, anywhere you're diving cenotes or around uh, freshwater inlets uh, or outlets uh, at, uh, 
uh, you know, into the ocean or the Gulf or wherever you happen to be. Cenotes, you see that a lot wherever cenotes uh, interact with, uh, with seawater. Also, we saw it, and if you ever watch Bering Sea Gold on Discovery Channel, um, we found it up there. Um, I wasn't diving up there. I was just working surface support. Would like to have gotten in, but I just wasn't equipped at the time. Uh, but Bering Sea Gold uses our, they use our equipment up in Nome, Alaska. Now, what happens there is they get, um, they get hype, uh, the water becomes, I believe, it's hyper, you know, in certain areas, hyper saline because the, um, uh, the fresh water is in this, is in, is now precipitates a salt because there's minimal salt in the, uh, in the frozen, frozen water. And you, so you end up with uh, a fairly, fairly heavy water there. And then there's also thermoclines and other things. Now, thermoclines, let's talk real quick about them. Thermoclines are both a refractive, a reflective, and a refractive surface. So when you think about this as a as a as a reflection, um, how does how do things reflect? And when you're talking about water, when you're off at an oblique angle, you'll get a reflection, more of a reflection than straight over over above. So if your divers are, are offset from your surface support and your transducer is above the, the, uh, the thermocline, the divers go below the thermocline and again, they're off at, a, at an angle. I'm, I'm trying to get in the camera here. Uh, there we go. So if they're underneath the thermocline and they're off at a farther angle, you get more of a reflection. And then also you get, and you, and you can have, depending on the angle, you can have as much as 90% of the signal. Think about that. You know, going from 10 watts to one watt or going from a one watt to a 10th of a watt. Um, and that's a considerable loss of signal. Now, the other thing that it'll do is as that, as that uh, signal hits that thermocline, that which does go through is going to refract. Uh, just like light on water. You know, if you're looking down on a fish, you're right over above it, you're right over above it. If you're looking at a fish off at the angle, for any of the bow fishermen out there, the fish is not where you see it. So you need to aim low, right? Because that light is coming up and refracting through the surface of the water uh, because of the varying densities of the uh, of the two medium, that being air and that being the hydrostatic environment of water. Um, so thermoclines, now the solution for that is to drop your transducer down below, if you have enough line, is to drop your transducer down below the thermocline. You can put one extension of 100 feet on all of our transducers. Don't go much far, don't add another 100 feet because you'll get line loss, There's line loss through the additional cable there. You can push it with one 100 foot extension and it should work just fine. Uh, but you will get a, uh, a lot line loss if you extend that too awfully far. Uh, so you can extend that down below the thermocline. Now, the other thing is to get your surface support over top of your divers. So if you have the means to be able to move over top of your divers, then again, you've eliminated or reduced that oblique angle uh, to the thermocline and the signal will shoot down through there more effectively. Um, so thermoclines, uh, that, so we've talked about interference, biological, mechanical, uh, acoustic noise, um, the uh, uh, you know thermoclines. One of the common questions as far as uh, turbidity in the water: um, how much does turbidity affect it? Will you be able to, you know, in muddy water? Sure, really, it doesn't have any effect on, or has minimal, if any, effect on the on the communications. What will have an effect on it is uh, is uh, really red tide. Red tide puts a gas uh, microbubbles into the water. Um, kelp and also fish. Uh, if you're anywhere where in, the, in California, we have rivers sometimes of sardines and and mini max, uh, mac, mini mackerels, and and it's beautiful to see. Uh, they they'll run in rivers, and you may have an issue with that. Another place where our equipment is used quite a bit is um, the uh, uh, salmon pens. And if you're using wireless communications on two sides of the salmon pen, salmon pens are usually like docks, set up like docks with big nets in between and the salmon are in between those. And um, because fish, all fish, most of them have uh, swim bladders, that's filled with gas and the signal won't pass through there. So if you've got a big school of fish between two divers, you're gonna have a hard time getting that signal through. It'll be limited that way. Um, so that's that's another thing that can have an effect on the, on the uh, uh, the signal, the red tide, as I mentioned, a common question too is swimming pools. How come our, our you know, through water doesn't work well in swimming pools? Swimming pools, uh, it depends on the water. Uh, some swimming pools are fine. Uh, swimming pools, 
because they're made of concrete and hard stuff, they, they can be a reflective surface. So you, if you're using a high powered unit, it can be kind of overwhelming because you got that, brrr, you know, it's like using a megaphone in a closet. Um, it can blare, blare pretty loud. Uh, minimal, uh, you know, buddy phones work pretty well in swimming pools. But now if you have an issue in your filtration system where it's sucking as a, you know, as, as the, the line passes, uh, as the, the velocity of water passes through a hole, often it'll suck water in if it's at a, at a valve or a joint or something like that. It can suck air into that and it'll micro bubble that. And if you look in your, in your swimming pool and look at the ladder and if on the ladder you see bubbles, uh, like like it's setting in a, a, a glass of Sprite, then that could be an indicator that your water is not going to be that great for through water communications. I've literally had, and it was a, a Ripley's Believe It or Not event out in the, in Hollywood um, on Sunset Boulevard. They had a guy on a billboard. This was one of the weirdest things. A guy on a billboard in a tank, and it was four feet deep by five feet wide, or you know, and then the depth was six feet, and he was just sitting down. He was going to do a world record uh, dive on a billboard. Uh, okay, whatever. And uh, reality TV being what what it is, um, you don't want my opinion of reality TV. Uh, but the guy he could wireless comms didn't work at all in that small environment there. And the reason why is because uh, it would have worked if we would have hung it right next to his head. But the reason why is they were bubbling that. Yeah, uh, with bubbles so that people could tell that he's in water up there. How do you know it's water if it's clear? You know, well, they put bubbles in it. So that interfered with the comms. So we strung him up with hardwired comms and he could talk to uh, so the people at the television production for that. Um, stupid thing. Okay, so uh, we're running a little over here, but I'm going to try to speed up here a little bit. So uh, water, air in the water. Uh, so the interferences, um, what am I missing? That's, that's, those are primary turbidity. Oh, aquariums. Uh, one of the things we generally with aquariums, I think we probably have some aquarium folks on here. Chime in if we have aquariums. Yeah, Brian's there. Brian Germick is on here. So he's from North Carolina Aquariums. Um, the uh, uh, aquariums can be noisy because they're usually um, reinforced concrete and steel and, uh, and anything that's pumping and making, you know, filters of, or, you know, pumps and compressors and stuff like that that's attached to the same concrete that the aquarium has the, has the potential of sending that in. Yeah, Rich, I'll try to get the microphones here too. Uh, it has a potential of transmitting that signal into the water and that can interfere with your through water communications. To give you an idea how bad that can be, I was with a friend of mine, Bill Mills, we were getting ready to go shoot um, uh, down in Cuba with uh, 60 Minutes. And we, I was working we're setting up our gear, doing a shakedown before we traveled. And all of a sudden, we heard this noise. And it was like, what is that? In his swimming pool. We, we stood up in the swimming pool. His neighbor's air conditioner came on. And it put an amazing amount of noise. Hey, Justin. Um, it put an amazing amount of noise into, the, into his swimming pool from his neighbor's uh, you know, central air conditioning system that went off. So think about that. Okay, I want to talk, uh, so those are some of the things that can interfere with the through water communications. I want to talk about, and this is probably one of the biggest problems, and this is not just with through water, but also hardwire communications. I touched about on this a little bit last week. But on the inside of the mask, there's a microphone. Now, this microphone is positioned well. Now, uh, if uh, the, the spectrum is kind of hard to get away from the microphone, the inner Spiro mask is, is one that's particularly difficult. Uh, in that people will take that microphone and they shove it down into the bottom of the mask. So the microphone has to be up off the corners of your mouth. And hopefully you can see this here. See where I've got that microphone exposed there. So it's right at the corner of my mouth. At a quarter of an inch, you lose half the volume. So what does that mean? Well, it means if you can your divers, one of the things that you want to think about um, about you, hey Josh, remind, don't let me forget. Jo, Josh Shepherdson uh, asked about moving water. I want to talk about that as well. There's another thing about moving water that's uh, that's a, a it's a an effect that that we I want to address. But that microphone again at a half an inch. If you can't hear your divers, they just sound distant. Then it might be that a good example is to is that or a good thing first first thing check the position of the microphone. 
uh, that microphone has to be up here. If it's stuffed down in the bottom, it, the microphone is a noise canceling microphone. The hot mic is a dual sided microphone. So, and, and the ME150 is as well. So in that it's a dual sided microphone. You have a hydrophobic membrane on one side, similar to Gore-Tex called VersaCore. On the other side is a material, it's a, it's a mylar material. So it's impervious. Nothing penetrates through the mylar material. It's not, it doesn't breathe. That the hydrophobic membrane, the VersaCore, allows it to breathe. So as you go to depth, as the, as the air compresses, as you go to depth, you know, we all know about, you know, Boyle's Law as it compresses. Um, so the, 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 it equalizes as it goes to depth. And you go to 100 feet, and it's equalized at that 100 feet, and it sounds the same other than the density of the air. going will across your vocal cords, will change the property a little bit, and I won't get into that. Um, but so, so that's the way the microphone works. It has to be here. Now, in that, it's a two-sided microphone, just like a drum. If you have a single, uh, you know, film of a drum uh, or skin of a drum, and you smack it on both sides, nothing happens. But you boom, boom, boom on one side, it picks it up. So any sound that impacts the microphone on both sides is negated, uh, is nulled. So it's um, so that's how the noise cancellation works. It has to go onto one side. If you're talking into the end of the microphone, it's going around it. Your microphone's not going to work very well. Um, the ME uh, ME 150, as I mentioned, and also the Super Mic all work basically the same way. Super Mic doesn't have quite the noise canceling properties as the ME uh, ME 16 does. Um, so then. Uh, and, and again, and another thing, it's a dynamic microphone. Energy in, energy out. If you don't, if you don't speak, loud enough and use your preacher's voice is what I usually refer to it as. So you want to keep your communication brief and say what you need to say and punch it out there. I mean, again, use your preacher's voice so that uh, you're talking to a crowd. So you'll want to speak up. If you're, you know, you're mumbling into it, you're going to sound mumbly on the other side too. So it's a dynamic microphone. So make sure you get that going. Hey, Mitch. Um, so, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, microphone position. Now I want to talk too about radios. As far as troubleshooting, now I'll just touch on that, um, and then I'm going to follow up here with uh, when Josh's uh, comment. Um, when you're troubleshooting, you want to always suspect batteries first, um, and you have to go through the process of elimination when something's not working. So suspect batteries first, uh, microphone second. Do an air test with your radios. I left my car keys over there, but uh, you can do. Uh oh, we're having pro. I got a double, I got a, we're having trouble playing this video. Anybody, to, pipe, pipe in here. I got a, I got a technical issue here. Everybody, can somebody pipe up? Is I, My screen just went blank on me. Everybody okay? Hmm. I don't know what's going on here. I said, I've got audio, but the video is locked up. I'm not sure what's going on. You see? Still? Okay. Good in North Carolina. Well, for some reason, this guy says, sorry, we're having trouble playing this video. Well, playing video. All right. If you can still see me, I can see what you're looking at. But anyway, um, what was I talking about? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. Process of elimination. Do air tests on your radios. You can, uh, you can, you, if your squelch is, depending on your squelch, if you shake your car keys for the transfer when everything is fired up, you want to short out, if you're using a 2010, you can short out with your fingers or you can, um, um, you can also, uh, okay, I'm so, yeah, for some reason my video is going. Short this out with a wrench or um, a screwdriver or whatever, and the light will light up and you'll be able to do an air test that way. The, the, the radio will stay on for about, 90 seconds. Buddy phones the same way. If you short out a buddy phone, you can, you, you know, again, put a, lay your wrench, uh, your backup wrench for your mask, uh, or you can lay that across there, short that out, and you'll be able to hear uh, any communications. Take your two radios and communicate uh, as you would underwater, but in the, in the surface, and you can, um, uh, you can, you can still, uh, uh, you can do an air test that way to make sure your gear is working. Scratch your microphone and listen. I'll take my 10. Uh, here it is. Take my 2010 and I'll have it plugged up and I'll, I'll you know, key the thing and I'll scratch a microphone. And if you lay the 2010, the cylinder here, up against your jaw, you'll hear it going. Ee, 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 ee. And uh, so, you know, you're transmitting that way. Um, so the, that's the way to do a, a quick troubleshoot. Yeah, I, 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 my video is just completely gone. I don't know what's going here, but you can still see it. All right. Um, 
the uh, the now back to Josh's point. Was it Josh? I mean, I'm scrolling back, back here. Moving water. Um, how does how does moving water affect the communications? Generally, it doesn't. Uh, unless you're in some place. No, don't have screensaver up. Um, generally, if you're if you're someplace like Puget Sound, we did have an effect up there that was kind of interesting. I was working with Canadian uh, military up there. And I think what we had there were shear lines. And um, so the with the, the shear lines where you have two currents come together and one's going one direction, one's going another direction, that that creates a similar effect to a thermocline. So that's one thing that I think the only thing. But the other thing is in, uh, in rivers. And I found this out diving the Colorado River uh, many years ago. Um, tumbling stones, that if you're anywhere near riffles, or rapids where you behind if you notice you'll see this when you're when you're uh, um, uh, when you're uh, so when you're drifting the rivers if you ever have a chance to dive there at uh, uh, Laughlin Nevada down below the dam there it's a wonderful dive it is one of the coolest dives and uh, clear water cold and uh, and there's a big thing called the swirl big eddy that you can get in and it's deep it's like 50, 50, 65 feet deep and it's really a cool dive um, Jeff Morgan's not on here I don't think today he was on last week but he and I did that dive several times it was great but anyway if you look behind the rocks you'll see a big rock you'll see the current going by and you see these little tumbling rocks and they're all bashing against each other and uh, uh, so that will uh, that will put an acoustic noise into the water, just like anything else, and that can interfere from a, a, a standpoint of of having a, a lot of a lot of noise in the water. Again, just like the conference hall with the you know the people standing around, rabble, rabble, rabble. Um, yeah, yeah, Brent. I my, my video is completely gone. I don't know if this is going to affect the recording. You know, when I download this or when I save this to YouTube or not YouTube, we are going to put it on YouTube. Um, that, but if it's saved there, uh, so um, anyway, so those are those are I, I've bounced around a lot, but hopefully I covered the uh, uh, a lot of the subjects here with wireless comms. Does anybody have any specific questions that I I I know there a lot of them scrolled past. I just couldn't read at the time because um, they they were they were. Uh, um, blasting past me and i didn't get a chance to. again ask the question in the, uh, in the feed here and i'll uh, i'll go in and i'll i'll do follow-up where i'll go through and i'll go through all your posts and questions and i'll answer them. you should get a notification that john answered or replied to your comment and uh you know we went a little long on this i i wanted to keep it down but i really wasn't locked into anything specifically we're at 54 minutes right now i haven't decided on what we'll talk about next uh comment as to what you'd like to hear uh, what you'd like me to address, and I will. Uh, um, I'll go through it and sort of by uh, show of hands, we'll we'll talk to you know. I'll talk about different subjects. Um, hardwire is easy. I could cover that in the future. Uh, if anybody's interested, I could do one. This is going to be a little more limited, a little more of a niche as far as putting underwater audio to your video. I could cover that. Um, that we also just as a couple of things, go to our website and use our website. If you haven't registered. Uh, go ahead and uh, register on our website, and uh, it, it, we don't spam you or anything. You might get a monthly newsletter. That's about it, and we'll we'll get that out to you. But um, there's a lot of resources on there is what I'm getting at. Our video section, look at that. Read the manuals. Uh, if you don't have a manual for the piece of equipment you have, that it should be available in our library there. So user manuals are a big deal, people. Trust me, read the manual. You'll learn a lot. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's a you know a good resource, and then don't hesitate to give us a call. You've got me on Facebook here. Uh, if you don't have if you're not on my uh, my list friends list on Facebook, you have any questions? I do a lot of business on uh, on Messenger, so I want to cut this now. Um, you guys, thanks a lot again. Post your questions. I'll get back to answering them, and uh, we'll look for. I look forward to it. I might be doing this every week, so we'll probably be doing another one once we figure out what we're going to talk about next week on Thursday. Uh, same time, same channel. All right. Well, thanks a lot for showing up. I appreciate it. Y'all stay safe out there. Stay healthy.